Would you pledge join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. See, all these guys don't know that there's not a crime. Okay. We, uh, welcome to this uh, study session. We have uh, several things to discuss. The main thing we're going to be working on this morning and getting information from Klingler and HMN Architects on uh, their jail study that they've been working on for the last few months. I wanted to, well, I'll do a little bit more later. Uh, I'd like to uh, open it up for public comment. We ask that you identify yourself and restrict your presentation or your comments to five minutes. So if you'd like to come up here or stand where you're at, whatever you're comfortable, I'd like to open it up for public comment. I'll go first. <clears throat> My name is Perry Alvin. I'm from uh, Newman, Illinois. I'm a farmer and I just live across, just across the line from Edgar County. I own land in Edgar County and I farm in Edgar County as well as Douglas. <clears throat> and I wanted to just address a couple of concerns about the wind ordinance that I know you are considering. Um, and there's so many issues. I'm just going to talk about one for a minute. Let me say though briefly about um, setback. Um, I look out my north windows now at the Broadlands Wind Farm, which was installed north of Newman every day, and I see red flashing lights all night long. And I don't live in the midst of the wind farm. I, I live about two or two and a half miles probably from the nearest wind turbine. But I just, I just want to suggest to you that you cannot overdo it on setback. The setback requirements are so important to people who live in the middle of a wind farm footprint. And, and, and without talking about numbers, I just want to emphasize that. But the thing I really want to talk about is decommissioning for a moment. And I think from, I've seen your wind farm ordinance draft, and what I gather from it is that you are going to make suggestions but that you're not actually going to specify anything in terms of decommissioning uh, terms for the uh, wind farm company and I just would like to suggest I've thought a lot about what things are going to look like 30 years from now in the middle of a wind farm footprint who's going to own the wind farm at that time and who's going to pay for the decommissioning because if you just get on the internet and Google abandoned wind farms and see what kind of pictures you get and what you look at and those things are environmentally problematic to get rid of at the end of their life so this, especially the blades because the blades are a, a plastic they cannot go in a landfill very easily they are so big that they're very difficult to transport they cannot be recycled, and they are just a big problem. <clears throat> so I would, re I would suggest, and of course you're the county board and I'm not, but I would suggest that it is part of the job or responsibility of the county board to provide for that so that 30 years from now people will look back and say, boy, I'm sure glad that county board did what they did back in 2021 or 22 or whenever you do it. And the only solution that I think works is a cash deposit. And, and the reason for that is two, two or three things. One is wind farms are notoriously sold several times during their lives. So they will not be owned by Orsted or whatever their name is that's proposing it today. The second thing is, unless you provide something in your permitting uh, ordinance, there is no requirement of financial responsibility on the part of the purchasers of the wind farm as it's sold two or three or four times during its life. So you don't know who's going to own it at the end of its life and you don't know how financially responsible they're going to be. And who cleans up environmental messes when you have one? It's almost never the landowner, even though it would be great if the landowner would specify in, in their easement that 
a cash deposit is required, but I, I just think that's beyond the bargaining power of a lot of landowners, and it's just not something you think of. But if a private engineering firm, a, a, an independent engineering firm, were to estimate the cost and a cash deposit was made, you would have them, and then you upgrade that every five years, kind of like what you've recommended but not required, I think, in your ordinance draft, then you would have the money available 30 years from now or whoever's on the county board at that time to clean these things up. And there is going to be a cleanup issue. It's, it's just going to be there. There's no question about it. Somebody's going to own this land at that point in time. And so that, that's what I'm suggesting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yep. Well, this, is, this is just comments. Okay. Yeah. All right? This is not a discussion. All right? Unless the board agrees to make it such. Just want to keep hear the comments and then we'll take it into consideration. Anybody else? Well, <laughs> my name is Will Cooley. I live in Brockton, Illinois. And uh, I just want to ask the uh, board on the wind farm ordinance to make an informed decision. And I hope that you um, do some research on it. <clears throat> See what happens to the wind farms uh, one year down the road. 10 years down the road, 30 years down the road. Harry talked about uh, what wind farms look like in, later, and you've probably seen pictures of, of these. I just printed these off the internet. And uh, take a look at those. That might be what uh, it'll look like. And then uh, the decommissioning, and Perry said everything about the decommissioning uh, costs, and then the setbacks. Uh -huh. I'm Glenda Waller and I'm a landowner in Edgar County and I just want to propose some questions and then you can take them up later. Uh, I want to be sure that the board members aren't only looking at the economic appeal uh, and, and as they brought up there are some negative um, impacts and I would like to know where the anticipated arc or placement of these towers are going to be uh, from Kansas to North, northern Edgar County and have the board members talked with or done a tour, tour of turbines the road conditions over at Harvest Ridge you might do that because I'm understanding that uh, some of the road conditions haven't been uh, returned to their uh, original uh, conditions and, um, it, well, I'm new to this. I don't know how much you've discussed. And uh, just know that I'm a concerned landowner uh, in Edgar County. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if most everybody knows me, I'm Kirk Allen. Um, in regards to wind farm, I know you had mentioned earlier what happened up in Newman and Douglas County. Uh, we passed zoning in Kansas on wind farms years ago, many years ago, and that was stripped of us from the last legislation. We knew then from the lobbyists that we may see that very same thing happen here at the county level. You have a moratorium in place. I would recommend or suggest, however you want to put it, take the time to really evaluate the information, even put together a committee both for and against of people to go over the information. I've got five or six binders of information that we use from all over the world to research before we put our zoning in place. And we, we researched this for close to a year. And we had a solid ordinance, and it was taken from us. When you talk about ordinances and zoning, which is what this ordinance basically is, your first obligation is to people's property values. Every zoning statute out there, that's number one, property values and safety. Property values, you show me one place that's ever put in these wind farms without proper setbacks, what happens to those property values? They tank. They are not enhancing anybody's property value. I just got sent uh, footage, I shared it on, on my personal <coughs> Facebook page from a friend in New Mexico, 20 to 23 year wind farm decommissioning is the biggest problem and they're literally blowing up the base letting them fall over and scrappers come and take whatever they want 
and then the, the government's left to clean up the rest of it. The people aren't. The landowners, people will say, well, decommissioning is their problem, it's on their land. Well, yeah, well, the landowner doesn't, they can't afford it. So who's going to clean it up? It ends up being an environmental issue, and it's always the government that cleans it up. Now, there's a lot of stuff that is on both sides of the aisle, and I know you guys get told one thing by the wind farms and something negative on the other side. I get that. Put a committee together of some independent people on both sides of the aisle and and do the research that some of us have done. And I know Douglas County did a whole bunch of it, and I forget the township that was up there that did it. But we spoke in Springfield with them on that matter. And big money is controlling this, period. I mean, they have bought off superintendents, that literally school board signed contracts that they would speak only positive about it. And if they ever spoke against it, they would have to pay the money back. That's blackmail. And that contract actually did get rescinded after we, we exposed that. <clears throat> you don't play fair in this world with this big business. They don't play that way. They do what they want for their best interest. And if you think otherwise, you're being fooled. All I've got. That's it? That's it. Since you're not going to let them ask any questions here, have some open transparency <laughs> discussion on it. Thanks. I would encourage, if you've got questions, send them because we'll publish the questions. We want answers to the questions. Uh, board committees, is there anybody that has anything that, that we really need to talk about this morning? Anybody? Uh, before we move on, I just I, want to... I guess I would. Okay. To some of these comments, uh, a couple weeks ago, after we had our meeting and discussion, uh, I went up there one evening, spent three hours driving around north of Newman, Garland area, and all that, basically the area that they, they're thinking about doing it, and um, drove around Douglas County, and uh, I stopped at about half a mile from one of the things. They're huge. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, it was windy that day. I was wondering if I could hear anything, because that was one of the, at one of the meetings we had several months ago, the people that came down from up north was talking about the, the noise, and that was their concern on the setbacks from residences, and of course it was windy that day, and I really couldn't hear anything. I drove around some more, and a guy was out mowing his yard, and I stopped and talked to him a couple minutes, and uh, he was not thrilled about it, but you know, he wasn't, he wasn't really complaining. Uh, he was three quarters of a mile away from the nearest windmill. He said he hasn't had any noise issues. Um, his big complaint was the roads, you know, the damage that they did to the roads. And uh, I know back when they were building the, the complex, I talked to two people that were working up there, and they said they just tore the heck out of things. And he said the company didn't care. They, they, they didn't care. They had a job to do. We had that same problem <clears throat> down here on the power lines. They didn't care that they were tearing the roads up. You know, they said we'll pay for it. Uh, they, but it's just that attitude. And you know, we're still dealing with the road situation with uh, the towers or the towers down south. I talked to a guy that drinks coffee up in Newman, and it, his take was, you know, 50-50 maybe on whether people are for it or against it, you know, just depending on your view. Uh, I talked to a guy that talked to a guy west of Paris, out in that area, that's got 40 acres he lives on. His concern was that, you know, he's only got 40 acres, and you know, you've got these big farms around him, he could be surrounded by these towers. And he, de he doesn't want them. And, you know, him being a little landowner, there's nothing he can do about it, you know. And, you know, I've made it clear that my stance is I don't want them in Acre County. I, every place I go seeing these towers, it ruins the, the countryside. I, I just remember coming from Newman, going back to 4936, looking to the north and seeing that, and then I turned to the south and there was nothing, I thought, what a relief when I started driving south.
So, you know, I'll, I'm still with, I don't want them, but I, I'd be reasonable. But uh, I'm at 2,600, and I'm not going to change that. I, I stopped at one that was a quarter mile away, and I thought, wow, those are huge. I mean, <laughs> it just, that just kind of overwhelmed me. And I was thinking the other day, looking out my picture window, if there was one a quarter mile from my house, and I had to live with that. I, I just, I'm looking out for the people that don't want it. You know, with our ordinance, the people can waive that 20, you know, whatever figure we come up with in the end, they can waive it. And the landowners, you know, not even a land, you know, someone owns a house, if they don't mind it being within, a, I think our ordinance says a thousand, they can, they can have that. That's their choice. We're not stopping that, but it's the ones that don't want it, I feel like we need to look out for them. That's it. We're, we're going to have this discussion in the next two meetings. Right. So, I mean, we've got a lot on. No, go ahead. You've asked twice. So. I just talked to a landowner who has, and then basically in his backyard, he has no complaints. That's just a different issue from you. You know, talk to different people so you can get different ideas and different uh, feelings, but that's just what he's saying. I've told you before, the only, my son's road commissioner in New York. George Bush and he uh, straightforward. He, he just pissed about the roads and the way they treat him. Because it just caused him an ungodly amount of work. He said they pay, but the what was said before they really do. Well, they made care. his life miserable for yeah. a while. Yeah. But uh, and I want to add, I agree. Decommissioning is a big issue. Oh, yeah. And I mean. Most of us aren't going to be around when that comes, but someone will be. And someone's got to deal with it. Well, and of course, we've got legal advice on how to right. handle that through citing right. and approvals, and they're pretty strong on how we should handle that. Right. Our legal advice. So, um, anybody? I mean, a couple. All right. Uh, the audit. We're going to have a meeting. Uh, our next study session. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the study session. Uh, Matt will be here. Schuler and we'll make a full presentation at a study session so that we can spend some time on it. The only thing we haven't gotten you is the single audit, which was just finished. So we'll, be, we'll do that this week, and then he will go over everything. Okay? Uh, let's see. Airport, we've had a major issue on the taxiway project. We broke through. We didn't break through, but, you know. So they're trying to figure out how to fix that. And, uh, the state and the engineers and their engineers and everybody's engineers are trying to figure out what happened. It was bored. They did core borings on it, and I guess what the core boring showed is really what's on a majority of that. So they took off a couple of inches of asphalt, milled it, or did they do the whole? According to Tom, they took four. Oh, and they're supposed to leave two. Right. And then in places, not everywhere, but in places. The dirt, the right. grounds come up through it. Right. The drains weren't working. They got on it too soon. Doesn't matter. We got. They got to come up with Plan B on how to fix it. Also, we found out since we've all been together that uh, we have two projects. The main runway, uh, the old one, is uh, approved to be resurfaced here next year, and then the platus or the control systems for. Uh, 300,000 has been approved also. So those projects can move through and uh, go forward. Uh, let's see. Bellwether is going to be here either the last study session in June or the first study session in July to go over the, their proposed personnel policy that's an update from what we've had. Uh, yes. I apologize. I've got another meeting to get to for an interview be here in 10 so do you care if I just give an update real quick Three. that's fine I apologize um, on the EMS side we did purchase another ambulance um, with state and Carl approval I'm hoping to have five in service right now we have four the plan was to replace one but I'm going to try to put five in service with one being a BLS unit we're taking delivery of that new unit in August 
first part of August, have, hoping to have that completed license by the middle of August. Also, board approved us. So we have two mechanical CPR devices. Uh, we've had great success with those so far, so we need to get approved for two more. So each ambulance will have a mechanical CPR device on it. Uh, new ambulance is coming, has about every safety feature that you can possibly add for crew and patient safety, so we're looking forward to that. Again, I apologize. Does anybody have any questions for me before I have to leave? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, the draft of the policy will be out and we'll have a meeting with the, uh, once they've had a chance to absorb it and get some input from department heads and elected officials. Uh, let's see. Callie Baker, we need to address that issue one way or the other on whether, whether we should offer help to them. I, I don't know what we can do for sure. You know what I'm, everybody know what I'm talking about. She wants to have some mural painted on her building. So, you know, I, I don't know where that would come from. But maybe somebody else has some ideas. We need to talk about that soon. Go ahead. So you're, you're um, talking about financial assistance, not just a letter of support. Well, we could do that. I mean, I, I don't know where where she's going with that. That seems usually chambers deal with those types of situations. And there, I used to be on a state board years ago that had to do with tourism and historic values of communities. And I don't even know if that committee even exists. Uh, it was, I forget under what department, Commerce and Community Affairs is where it was. So I had suggested that to Callie, but I don't know whether anything has happened to that. I just don't want to. We go over an answer one way or the other. She gives you some idea how much she's going to do. No, what kind of money she's looking for. I think she did say a project similar was what I, she. She got a quote for 4900 That's right. Yeah. So but I, if I remember right, I looked in our funds and we've got 900 in hotel motel. And that comes from one place in Chrisman and two place places. Two, and is there one in Grandview or Kansas? Yeah, Grandview. 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 Yeah. yeah. But I don't know whether I'd have to read whether we can legally use those funds for that. I don't know that we can or can't. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, but if we, we'd have to, if we were proposing that, I think we'd have to ask Mark if we could even use the funds for that. She's talking about the building where she has her office, has a mirror on the first half, and the second half would be the... That's what I'm assuming. Okay. You know, I, I she wants know. to put it on the front where the brick is, I think. Oh, okay. okay. She has one on the uh, east side. East side, correct. Okay. okay, and then, uh, I mean, we need to be thinking about that and have some kind of an answer for her or some direction. Uh, tax information from Augie's office went to Don's. I think that was yesterday, or I mean, last late last week. End of the day on Friday. Okay. Those are just things I wanted to make sure you were aware of. Uh, the, uh, the state of Illinois sent out uh, over a half a million dollars uh, to the county for uh, the townships and. That was, I think, the fourth of the six payments that they were going to make in the county. Highway Department received roughly 120000 So that is happening. Augie, did you have anything else to, to add? Okay. No, well, yes, I do. Uh, I just thought of it. Last week when I talked to Callie, I asked her if she'd contacted the Edgar County Community Foundation, and she had not yet. So I, I, I was directing her over to that. That's and, a good uh, idea. So. Yes, ma'am. I have a couple questions on airport. Yes. So if we're if there's some failure where they've been tearing it up, where's the cost going to come from? Where's that would come pay? from the FAA funds that the state <coughs> controls. And they do have extra funds. And then they also have the rescue funds. So. It's not to say that we're not going to get hit for 5% cost of whatever it costs to fix it, but 
So is there maybe some drain work, tile work that needs to be done under that? I've heard you say drain. Yeah. We uh, don't know. We don't know. Okay. And the engineers are taking a look at it the next few days and then working with the state. And then they'll come up with, I'm sure we'll have some information uh, in the next study session. Okay. And then that other uh, runway? Yes. Is, the, is it the same thing that's going to be done or is it just putting resurfacing on top? This, the main runway would be resurfacing only. And of course, the main runway is, we're not talking taxiway, which is this thing. We're talking the main runway is relatively thick. So yeah. what are, what are, do planes just get diverted to somewhere else until that project, this well, current we have, project is done? No, the, the airport is still open. Uh, they just don't, can't use that taxiway, mm -hmm. okay? And Someday with the, I'm going to go get a tour up there now. Yeah, well, that in the jail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to have, know. yes. Um, anyway, that's what I had. Yes. Did you say you don't think we have to come up with 5%? No, we may have to come may up have. with another 5%. Yes. yes. That's possible. But we also could use that uh, infrastructure under the new bill list that. So we should be okay, but I can't guarantee what's going to happen until I get a final report. Okay. Anyway, we got study sessions that uh, have a lot going on with it here in the next few months. Okay. Uh, I wanted to preface uh, the jail presentation to let you know that what you have received and what you have in front of you is draft. It, it is totally you know, a concept that we can take a look at, investigate, give direction, but eventually uh, this presentation will also be made on the 21st of June. Am I correct? 21st of June to Coles County. Uh, our architects and engineers have been working with Polk's County on, on the information and uh, they are very both very supportive of each other. Is that fair to say? Okay. Uh, I'd like everybody that's connected with Polk's County to introduce themselves and then you folks if you would introduce yourself to the board. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Kelly Lockhart with Polk's County Regional Planning. Uh, we actually do work for Coles County and every county that surrounds Coles. Hello, I'm Kevin McReynolds. I'm the Grants Compliance Manager for Coles County Region Planning. And these two gentlemen, along with their staff, were responsible for preparing and giving and successfully getting us a grant from the USDA for what, 160? Uh, 150. Okay, $150,000 that they'll be using and have been using and will continue to use for the next year plus. Okay? Gentlemen? My name is Sean Harding. I'm with HMN Architects. We're a, uh, it, uh, we do jails and healthcare as our two uh, markets of choice that we work in. And I'm Michael Fries. I'm an architect with Klinger and Associates for an architecture and engineering firm. Our two firms have partnered together on a couple jail projects, and I'd be happy to speak with you here about the Anchor County Jail study that you receive a draft copy and email from, and then also so, no, do you want us to start? Take it away, guys. Okay. Maybe you might spread out a little bit, we're not just in the corner here. I'm going to slide over this one. Yeah, you can actually. Thanks everyone for allowing us to come to visit. We sent over some PDFs at the end of the week, last week, and that was to, wasn't everything that's in this binder. This binder has kind of a compilation of all the information. What we wanted to be able to get to you was the main report that shows here was our assessment of the jail, and then also share with you some of the uh, population study information that was prepared. We have a third team member that's not here with us today because uh, he doesn't necessarily travel and actually he's ill at the moment. But Bill Gardnels is our jail population specialist. He's the one that takes all the jail population data that comes from the sheriff and the jail administrator and is able to say historically here is the highs and lows for jail population and then be able to forecast into the future how many beds in the jail do we need to plan for. And so that was part of the information sent to you. And then the thing that gets people all excited is when they get to see an architect draw a floor plan. 
So inside here we have a preliminary floor plan, and we like to use the word preliminary because this is the first brush being able to come up with information we've gathered from interviewing the sheriff and the staff and the jail about what the floor plan of the jail could be configured to and also placing it on the site. By no means is this the final plan that's going to be constructed. Because as you can imagine, as we do anything in public work, whether it's working on county jails, schools, even hospitals in the private sector, these things evolve and change over time. But it's the first, first blush being able to say, here's what we base upon what's been discussed and what we've got the input from the sheriff and the staff. We're able to say, here's about the approximate size jail that would comply with current Department of Correction standards. And then being able to fit that onto a site, in this case it was a site owned by the county, to be able to show the <coughs> size foot, building footprint on a site. And so um, I know Sean had a few talking points he wanted to go over, but I kind of wanted to give you just that general introduction. And again, this is, as the chairman said, this is, I guess you want to call it our first draft here. We'll be finalizing this with input from you folks here. And what the intent is that by June 21st, when we have that next presentation, we'll have final edits made, and that will be pretty much the completion of our study that we've done for you on this particular project. Any opening uh, softball questions to get started? Uh, question. You said that you uh, cited it on a piece of ground that we already own. That's not to say that that may not be the site because the multiple sites are being looked at, correct? Correct, yeah. In our proposal, we uh, told the county that working for you, we would do two site studies. <coughs> So we wanted to be able to, for the be able to, for the purpose of this meeting, be able to have at least one site shown. That in this case, it's the, I believe it's the old Floyd Hague site. That's the historical name. The property across the street from the jail that became a parking lot, and uh, it was convenient to use one because it's close to the jail, but two, it's also owned by the county. And we also know in our experience doing this with different clients, when you start talking about ideal properties before you own it land prices tend to change. And so we wanted to be respectful of that. <laughs> and uh, the second site plan, which is part of our contract to provide, will be done in the near future when we're, uh, that information has been shared with us. Uh, but the idea was to be able to show what this will look like on the site, because a lot of people seeing is believing. You want to be able to see what it looks like, and then you can uh, have some of your conversations of how you might want to approach other sites. It also just gives you a good visual scale of what a 50 bed facility looks like with all the various depart, you know, areas in the jail that are, are what we've gone through the program and, and taken care of. It gives you an idea how much site that takes up, and it, it's a considerable amount of that site across the street. So with the, real, uh, the jail um, included in this building is having the jail. Currently, your jail site also houses the 911 dispatch. That would be moving over. We have accounted space for that. On the southeast corner of the jail, if I'm correct on my uh, coordinates here, we have the county server farm and the ICN, the Illinois Century Network uh, point of presence, which is a very large system of servers that connects most of the school districts in the area and some the law enforcement center. And uh, based upon preliminary information that we've been given to us, uh, as you folks know, that's on a major fiber optic line connection. And we've been told that that can relocate if it stays close to that fiber optic line. So going across the street at this time in the preliminary discussions, that seemed to be pretty favorable. So that's another reason why we chose to work at that site there across the street. And so relocation of that is actually included. So um, when it gets down to the end of it, the uh, site where the current jail would be vacant, there would be no buildings left behind. The radio antenna there would also be relocated as well. So I guess before we start talking about the new building, we should probably talk about the existing building a little bit. And uh, so in part of our report in this binder, 
and we've uh, put in reference information from some of the studies that have already been done. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you had some issues with the jail. The jail was shut down for a period of time, and several firms and organizations came through and did very detailed report assessments of your jail. And uh, we typically do similar studies ourselves. And so we wanted to make sure we put those in there as reference. So that way, as you're looking through our information, well, what did, say, Sycamore Engineering do a couple of years ago? What did they say? It's all in there for you there in the reference sections in the back. Our study that we put in, I'm going to let Sean talk about this more specifically, is trying to look at your jail, your existing county jail, from a safety and an operation standpoint. I'll let Sean take it from here. Well, I laid my report out uh, similar to how a um, USDA form would require us to lay out uh, the way the report is written. Um, so when we went through and looked at the facility, um, you know, some of the things that I knew that there were discussions from Sycamore, and I know there were some uh, letters from the Department of Corrections from the state of Illinois. Um, so I went through and just looked at it from an operation standpoint that I've been doing this since 1995 and have a fairly good understanding of things that are uh, positives to the safety and security of inmates and staff. So I walked through looking at those kind of things. Um, one of the things that you find in any facility as old as the facility that you guys are using right now is it was built in a time when the inmates were a little bit different than they are right now. <laughs> um, the old construction where they used the slat strap um, construction for the cells, you know, those inmates uh, at that time, um, there was not problems with uh, some of the mental health issues and stuff like we've got now. So. Um, Today's cell design is much different looking. Actually, the, the newer part, portion of the jail is actually designed similar to what we do. A lot of our, our jails that we design today are, there are no points where a person can tie a ligature off to a you know, place in the cell and, and uh, harm themselves. So there's no way for those people to necessarily reach through those areas and grab a hold of a staff member and potentially hurt a staff member. So, you know, the first thing I notice when I walk through the old portion of the jail is the, it's it's an old jail. <laughs> it's got that capability for self-harm and, and harming of staff. Um, also, um, it was pretty evident when I read the state of Illinois comments that there had been some issues with heating and cooling and, and some of the plumbing issues and stuff. Um, those old plumbing uh, fixtures that are in these jails, they look the same, you know, 40 years ago to today. Um, some of the things that we've learned over those years is the valve boxes and stuff are more easily replaced now on the new stuff than it was on the old fixtures uh, in that facility. So very quickly, I look at the security aspect of things. You guys can't have enough people watching those old uh, areas of the jail without the use of cameras. Cameras weren't available back when that jail was built in 1892. So we've taken care of that by using uh, security surveillance systems. Um, those walls are hard. You can't run conduit secured within a wall. You're going to expose it. It's going to be off the wall. So there's access to low voltage. There's access to power. There's access to ligature points. There's, there's a lot of issues with surface mounting that stuff in a facility. If anything, they'll just tear it up and you'll have no camera or no intercom or <coughs> some of those kind of uh, issues. Uh, the worst case, somebody ties off one of those spins off on the floor, asphyxiates themselves, and you get a lawsuit. So um, we walked around and looked at that. I'm, a, I'm an architect. I actually love looking at these. That old stone structure is amazing to me. Um, I'd save all of them if I could. I just wouldn't house inmates in them. Um, sprinklers. I buy all modern code standards, any place a person spends the night and they're not in control of the situation, that building should be sprinkled. And it's not that the building is made of combustible materials, although there are combustible materials in that facility. You know, they get letters from family, they get paper, they, they, these guys find ways to squirrel away stuff that you would never expect them to get, it, even commissary items and whatnot. Um, 
they'll light mattresses on fire. They will find ways of creating spark or e-cigarettes or whatever it is that they can get a hold of. They'll they'll find ways of creating a flame, and that is you know smoke is what kills people more than the flame does. So um, I've worked on two county jails recently. We've built new jails for Wright County, Missouri, and Ava. Uh, pardon me, Douglas County, Missouri, which is Ava. Uh, where they had inmates light mattresses on fire or create enough heat to cause smoke in those facilities and had to you know evacuate the facilities uh, so modern jail has smoke evac systems modern jails have sprinklers we can eliminate a lot of those issues by the new systems that are in place by code now um, and those they're not present in this facility um, I've kind of bulleted my concerns in section B here and we can just go through that a little bit what you've got is two distinct floors on the existing jail and you've got so he's in uh, tab section number three yeah I'm That's sorry the uh, our assessment report and so when you go to second page, second page we talk section about existing B. conditions we're talking about the bullet points down at the bottom these are kind of the, the major highlights that we noted when we walked through so when this jail was built, the sheriff lived in the facility. And, you know, it was, like I said, um, if you ever watched uh, Mayberry RFD, I mean, Otis, we had a lot of Otis back in those days. We don't have Otis as much as we used to have. So, you know, the family members maybe even made some of the meals for the inmates at that time. Um, again, those, those days are gone. So there were no posts on the second or the first floor per se. The, the sheriff, with a small staff, checked on the inmates, and, uh, and I assume there was some kind of a time frame that was involved in that at the time. But uh, there were no posts. Nowadays, with the mental health issues and things that we deal with, or even uh, coming off of a high of some kind, it's fairly necessary. It's necessary to have people tour the facility on a regular basis. We call it watch tour, and that allows them to make sure that they don't have somebody that's causing self-harm. With those two floors, there was no post, per se, for a uh, staff member. Um, I will tell you, most of my designs, I try to keep them on one floor and try to keep a single post. It helps with staffing, and it also gives them a better view <coughs> of uh, the whole facility where inmates are kept. Uh, and I talked a little bit about that linear layouts in essence what we had on those two floors were linear layouts in other words a, a staff member would have to walk down one side of the cell bank and then walk around and walk down the other side of the cell bank so they could monitor people in the back cells as well as the front cells um, on this in this situation cameras suffice as the eyes for the uh, staff by doing that and with the slat cells it's a little harder to see what's going on in those cells um, as I understood reading the uh, state of Illinois report, the uh, upper floor is not habited uh, because of some issues with water and HVAC issues. Um, it also, you know, your response up to that floor, you're going to have to run up a set of steps to get to it. Um, that's, again, why we look a lot at single floor, uh, one level um, housing on most of our designs. Um, the functioning mechanical systems, right now, I just from my walk in there, I would say don't need the repair changes required by the codes right now for an institutional occupancy. Uh, I, I've not measured that. I'd, I'd have to hire a test and balance company to tell me that for sure, but you can kind of walk into a room and feel if it's a little mud, you know, muggy in the rooms or not. Um, and obviously, guys, this has been a weird year. It's been a weird year for my firm. I, I'm guessing Clean Air could say the same thing. Um, I've we do a lot of health care. I've had to make a lot of changes in what we do in design. Um, you know, you have one person walk into an emergency department that has COVID and I've shut down an entire portion of a hospital and that just doesn't happen. We can't do that. A lot of this, what we're talking about in these, I mean, if you get flu, uh, medical resistant tuberculosis, MRSA, they're all very contagious diseases. You get those in a jail and it spreads if you don't have the right facilities so we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the medical side of things as well but mechanical systems play a huge role in that and keeping some of those uh, pathogens 
um, moving out of the facility at all times. Um, ADA or ADAG as we call it. Um, there's not anything about the old jail that would, <laughs> that meets any of the um, handicap accessibility standards. Um, you got to get up two or three steps just to get into that first level uh, from the new jail, and you got to go up. Steps. There is a ramp, but you got also, there are also steps up to the to the new 1980s edition. Uh, the other thing to piggyback on that is. We're probably not going to very many ADA <clears throat> employees working there, but occasionally inmates do come with accessibility issues. The other side of it, too, if it's not ADA accessible, that means if the medics have to come and bring a stretcher cot in, it's not easy to get a stretcher cot in from an ambulance, too. So that in terms of medical response, too, there's some issues there, so that's something important to think about. I mentioned earlier there's there are some wood throughout the old 1892 structure. There's wood stairs, there's wood in the nailers and the, the roof structure and stuff like that. Um, obviously, we design our facilities to be non-combustible and there are uh, major changes since 1892 in, in the codes for that very reason that you know these, these people do find ways of creating uh, a fire or smoke in a facility like this. And then, just the age of the, you know, I, I can't tell you that every bit of electrical has been replaced in this facility. It's up to standards or, or you know, current code. So those are things that you need to worry about. Um, you right now don't have a sally port, so you're, you're walking people in to book them in. That happens in a lot of facilities that I've worked uh, with over the years. A sally port was kind of a luxury, but it's also a, a liability issue for somebody. Um, Sheriff, sure, you might be able to, to give me some backup on this, but if they're if you're going to have a problem with an inmate, it's usually right at when they start the booking process. They're either at the kind of the fight and flight it's kind of the thing happens at that, that, that point. They're not going home tonight. Yeah, they they they've been caught. And now they know they're going to have to go through this process, and that's usually where things happen. A lot of times, salad ports. Sally Port is basically a garage, and it's usually you know, one or two doors, and it's a safe place to unload an inmate to bring an inmate into the facility and start the intake and booking process. Um, uh, you only have one holding cell, as I understand it right now, for a booking area. So if a, a group of people were brought in, a party was broken up or whatever, you have uh, multiple, you know, two genders. And I won't get into that whole discussion, but we have two genders. You know, you you've got to find a home for somebody other than that holding cell. Um, so it'd be nice to have that. Also, the other thing about, and I like doing jail, so I might go off some rabbit trails here every once in a while. But um, that's also typically where I'll have padded cells or, or places to put somebody that's either coming down from something or just as has a, a condition that that they don't work well with others and we put them in a padded cell and I usually have that in a, in a booking area. Um, <clears throat> that's also another point in the facility where the introduction of contraband is it's highly likely so that's the other reason why holding cells are good because they can go through a true process of getting the intake and booking taken care of, check that person over before they're introduced into a housing area. Uh, I mentioned no fire sprinklers. Um, that's against the code in any I3 occupancy nowadays. Um, retrofitted security electronics, we talked about that just a little bit. Um, I think I've got a picture in there where you guys have made use of a port uh, that leads in that you can either drop tear gas or whatever within the, the cell, there's an opening there. Maybe as a gun port. I don't know exactly what that is. I don't know if I've ever seen one. But there is a port into the housing area that, that is now has become a, a, an area for them to um, bring conduit out of that area from the cameras and, and from the uh, other devices that they installed. And it's a, a, um, a port for that conduit to come out. And all the switches are around that port. It's actually quite an amazing picture, I think. Um, we talked about the original jail bars, the riveted steel strap, they limit the visibility, it's an easy place for an inmate to tie a ligature to. Um, 
openings and straps also allow inmates uh, the ability to reach through and attempt to reach staff. Um, staff office is the booking area in the control room in the newer 1980s facility. Um, the one thing I will say about that is when I walked in there, all the doors were open, so if somebody did happen to get loose and ran the hallway, they had access to any of those rooms. Um, uh, I do like simple circulations like that. We can just limit some of that by uh, closing off Sally ported areas or man port areas to keep uh, people from moving up and down that hallway completely. Um, uh, the current layout is not favorable for classification of inmates. It's not that it's not, we've got areas to put people, there's just not enough areas to, typical classification separates people into seven different types of groups. That would be minimum, medium, maximum male, minimum, medium, maximum female, and then a segregation unit. That's how we use the, you know, when I say I need seven day rooms, that's what that breaks them up as. Um, we can get by, and I do this in a lot of small rural jails, that we get by with maybe five classifications a lot of times. A lot of, we usually have the minimum, medium, maximum male. We usually have a segregation. We usually have a mixed or subdivided day room for females. Because the population of females, while it is growing, is still not the same level as it is for males. So we can look at all that. I think what we've done is we've actually made five smaller day rooms of about ten inmates each in our design so we can give you that classification capability and then have some areas within booking that you can use for medical, some for uh, mental um, that can stay in that area. I think we've got four or five cells in the, in the booking area. Um, but that allows the sheriff the ability to separate people that need to be separated. And I think everyone thinks, well, the murderers are the bad guys, so they're, they're the SEGs and the guy who wrote a bad check or whatever, he's the minimum security. It doesn't work like that. It never has worked like that. Usually, as a matter of fact, I, I would, Sheriff, I would maybe ask you if uh, some of your some of your uh, people that you have to separate from others are sometimes the least in a, in terms of offense, but they just don't have a temperament for being in the facility. Um, shower. This is a little nitpicky, but uh, I'm. In modern jail design, we usually have 12 inmates per shower. Uh, in some, some ways, you can look at it as one per eight. Um, right now, I think one of your showers doesn't even function. And so you probably are shy in your showers. There's no infirmary. Uh, the kitchen is no longer utilized for production, and that area could probably be repurposed. You guys are doing a warming kitchen, which um, that also goes into part of the design that we've been looking at. Um, it right now functions as the staff area, staff break area. The dumb waiter that ties the kitchen to the upper floor of the jail is wood framed and it's actually a fire hazard in terms of construction materials. You've got some 9 by 9 vinyl composite tile uh, which typically means that the glue or the tile itself has asbestos in it. Um, and I'm guessing if that's there there's some probably pipe insulation that also has some asbestos in that as well. Uh, penetrations and through the wall of uh, several places, especially I think lower level, they're not sealed with fireproof topping. You can see some of the photos that I've added uh, through this on some of the areas. Uh, top two are ones going up to the upper floor, the one is the attic, and then two down in the basement. <coughs> the next page you can see the uh, steps up to the lower level of the original 1892 jail and the strap still door and then the court with the multiple electrical devices that are using that port for access for the conduit. And then the new modern jail, which is, I'll be honest, you look at you look at something I just did, it doesn't look that much different than what you're seeing in this uh, 1980s edition. Um, layout that I do might be a little bit different, but the materials, the way it's done, the doors and all that are done actually not much different than what I would do today. Um, we talk a little bit about the proposed facility, and you obviously there's a, a section back there that has a layout for you guys to take a look at, and that's based off the program that I sat down with the sheriff and the jailer, and we went through a program of spaces they felt they needed, and I will tell you that's kind of a wish list. I mean, we kind of go through and 
what would you like to have? I mean, it's like the kid in the, you know, with the Sears catalog. I mean, you mark every page. It doesn't mean you're going to get it all. You know, Santa might not treat you well, but that's the starting point for this. And then you whittle down. There's always a budget, and that's the thing that I don't think, you know, there's a lot of guys that will sit there and say wants and needs, and they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. We, we understand that there's budgets that we need to work from as well. So um, we went through and, and uh, looked at the, and the program, I believe, is Section 4. So you can kind of go through and see what we did in Section 4. After the fact, it's fairly boring reading, but it talks about janitor's closets and stuff like that. Um, so when we talked about programming in the architecture world, that was really interviewing. So interviewing the yes. sheriff and the staff, asking questions, what are your building needs and building wants? And then they tell us, you know, different functions or different types of rooms. And then when you look at section four, you see where we started in our experience, be able to approximate what size of rooms or what size of spaces those are. So we can start to work towards developing that first floor plan. So again, these are, it's a compilation of all the study work that we've done, and it's trying to capture everything. And then as we go through a conversations like this with you folks, then we start to whittle it down, like Sean said, to make sure that we're getting you know, exactly what you're needing, at least we're capturing everything up front. Yes. So um, one of the things that I used in kind of our discussion was the layout of Warren County Jail that um, we've been working on with Klingner. And um, it's about the same. It's a 48-bed facility, so it's close. Um, and there was some discussions about courts and EOC and training and I like to make most of my jails have some, I like my rooms to have multiple purposes because square footage in a jail is expensive. So I look at every room and say, how many times are you going to be in emergency operations center? You need to have everything in place, but how often is it going to be that? How often it be when it's not an emergency operations center? So, you know, I. The plan that we did for Warren is different. Housing on, on the plans that HMN does are all going to look similar. I usually have a hub and then the spokes that create the day room walls. Um, what that does is it allows one person or two, depending on how you want to staff it, good visual lines in all the housing areas. Um, from a county standpoint, it's a, a much better system in terms of liability and every other thing. Um, Again, I have to, I work in rural facilities pretty much every day of my life, and nobody ever has the uh, amount of staff or the, the, the abilities to just go find somebody easily in the county, for a county facilitators. The candidates are limited because a lot of my rural counties, the population is declining, and they have to pass a certain number of criteria to be able to be hired by a, a facility. You can't hire felons to, to house felons. so. Um, we have to think in terms of how we staff these things as well. Um, you go down to the, the page seven, um, you'll see typical day room setting to give you an idea what those slices of pie and that hub and scope spoke design look like. And then you'll see also a typical cell that is uh, of, of just a recent gel that we just completed. Um, this is uh, Wright County. I believe this is Wright County in Missouri. They all kind of look the same, so I have to think about when I see the stenciling or whatever, which one I've done there. You guys are doing about two county jails a year. I did six in the last two years, so then I've got three more that I'm in the process of finishing documents on. So yeah, we we stay busy with, uh, we do, I work on jails every day, all day, so. Um, one of the things we talk about a little bit about materials. Um, currently, there are lots of issues with bidding projects right now with bar joists and precast because the big companies like Amazon are building these giant warehouses all over. Um, that's supposedly going to, uh, that burden is going to be reduced in late summer of this year or early 2022 is what I'm being told. Now that, that information is only as good as Amazon decides not to build, you know, another, you know, <coughs> few hundred warehouses across the country. 
Um, in essence, what they've done is they've, they've told companies like Volcraft and New Millennia that make uh, steel bar joists that we will be paying you a premium and you will be doing our stuff before you take on other people's work. I, I was told that one of my gels was complicated. And I said, are you kidding me? You guys have done most of my gels. I've never had you tell me they were complicated. What he said was, it's a lot more complicated <laughs> than a half a million square foot warehouse that uses the same joist from one end to the other. So, um, so our joists are when you go into like a big box store or a grocery store, you look up at the ceiling, you see those steel bar joists are coming across. That yeah, it looks like a kind of a zigzaggy looking ladder across the top that holds the deck up. Um, so um, that's one of the things that I think should be brought up. I think people should be aware of is right now that that is a, a sensitive subject with contractors and, and builders right now is that uh, for the next probably eight months to a year we're going to see a, a very, I would say, a higher market than what we've seen in a, ever in terms of construction right now. So, um, this might be a good time to pause and see if there's any questions. Sure. Yes, sir. I'm looking at some of these things where <clears throat> you and I kind of talked and we came in one time. Um, this is just a general basic floor plan. I mean, and that's that's the Warren County. Yours right. is a couple of sections back. Warren, you showed me before. Um, so have you drawn up a plan for us? Yes, yes, a couple sections back okay. in the folder. Go back to section six. Bed count actually is higher by a couple than Warren, and then you wanted more cell space than the dorm space. So I changed that, and then there were some other things that actually we didn't talk about, but there was some questions in that, uh, people asking about like emergency operations center and some of that. So you'll see some spaces in there that we didn't talk about, but it's been brought up to us that it would be beneficial in this facility. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is all from mm -hmm. yeah, this is two first floor. Draft, so we'll, right. so That's where you show up the amount of discomfort. Yeah. So what we refer to it as a mezzanine, so I don't I can get by without putting an elevator in. So it's basically just a walkway. So you go up a set of stairs to a walkway in front of the cells. Yeah. And it's basically a, a, a copy of that floor plan. It becomes a mezzanine, except it's just the stairs in that five-foot walkway, as opposed to the old day room floor. So that's considered ADA because anybody and I can get anybody down on the same looking thing on the lower level. Okay. Okay. So quick question: Where did you put the padding stalls at? I've got those. Actually, they'd be booking unless you want them in a day no, room. I'm just, I'm just asking. Yeah, we. And it'll just say hold on right now. We just we got those in hold. Okay. okay. So you can, because and the only reason why I ask is I went to a jail over in Indiana here I don't know probably a month ago, and their padded cells where you've got your dress in, mm -hmm. they've got a padded cell on each side of the dress in, with a doorway coming from each one of the padded cells into where the dress in where the shower is. So they made an ant kind of an ante room. And yes, where the yeah. shower and all that kind of stuff is and the toilet and everything else. So that way when they have an issue where the individual takes a shower, they can take him from there to there without moving them okay. out into a good room. Um, and I like that aspect of when I seen it in, in Tarp Um the stacking of the cells. Are you still talking about double two yeah, four? Yeah, they would have a mezzanine level. Okay, so level. you're you putting a I think graded pens or whatever all the way to the ceiling, or are you going to have that would be rail? typically we put like a 54 inch guardrail up with vertical so they can't use it like a ladder. But uh, most all my juveniles we have to fence, we have to take it up to the soffit. And that's so, kind of what I was asking, and that's fine. We've done that. I think Douglas County, Missouri, we've got a uh, full, full height cage on all those. Because of my background, I've seen guys throw them off of a free belt deck before. Yeah, we're not to that level of detail in right. this one. Okay. I mean, 
I mean, so I'm just asking a question. I might actually just put the word office on a few things because I don't know okay. how you guys want to okay. how do you guys want to do this. Some of this. Typically, I put my padded cells right across from the booking desk so that that right. person has to oh, go into yeah. it. But yeah. the idea of having a shower in between and a kind of an ante room makes some sense. Because that's where they had was their dress in cell was like their dress in was between the two yeah. padded cells. Oh, which, and typically, you'll have them in what a, a, a we call. So I can talk cop with him. We call them a pickle suit. It's a padded suit that ties on the sides, and they don't have anything they can shred and right. tie off to anything. So um, typically, the person in a padded cell is very little to work with, and and you don't want them having anything because that padding is very expensive. And if they have handcuffs on, they'll use those handcuffs to mar up the the Lexan on the window and. They'll use it to tear up the padding in the cell, and it's 20, about 25 grand a cell right now to, to do a cell of that. So what they have in the shower and everything in there, would that eliminate their dress-in thing and everything? And it, but basically, you use the shower for your two padded cells plus bringing people in on, on intake and everything else right there and bring them back out. And this is a fairly detailed plan for this level that we're talking right now, but. I know guys that do jail operations are going to be a little bit more critical and they're going to want to see how that flow works because that's all the jail is about flow, bringing people from a salad board into booking, into the housing, and then if they bail out, how do they bail out? How do we go, how do we go about that process of getting that person back out and avoid contraband issues and stuff like that? So I'm probably a little more detailed than I typically would be, but no, you're yeah, right. I was just, I'm just because I, I really like that idea when I seen when I was over there and it's uh, up at Petersburg in Fountain County and their jail saw uh, I think it's nine months a year old something of that nature. A lot of times uh, after hours there's nobody setting in the, the reception area or the jail admin area so we usually put a window from our control room area into the public lobby so that those people can if somebody and the doors are usually tied into a security electronics or access control system that allows a door to signal somebody in control when the door is open and when that door is open they know to go over there and check the lobby sometimes that's a person running away from somebody and they need help and then sometimes it's a bell bondsman trying to figure out if he wants to bail somebody out and wants to do a face-to-face -face -face with that person so you'll see that our control room kind of works into the lobby as well as the, the five housing areas in the exercise yard. On your exercise yard, another question I was going to ask, is that got a skylight? Are you putting skylights in yours? Or do you have, the one thing they had was they probably had, this, I don't know, it was probably 30 foot tall. I don't know how tall your exercise area Typically, is. we, to meet uh, American Correctional Association, we have to be, I think it's 18 feet. Okay. And that's based on reasons that you'll never do a basketball right. shot, which right. um, we just we don't advocate using putting a basketball goal or anything in those. And just let them walk or do their right. calisthenics or uh, whatever. But they had uh, metal shuttered windows, two of them, okay. that they could use a button from inside the control center that opened the which gave light in. Yeah, we oh. usually do a coiling overhead okay. door and then a, a security grid and then. I would. I always ask for a hell screen over that to keep the birds and stuff right. from coming right. in. Okay. Uh, we have recently, though, when the weather's bad, we have been putting skylights in as well, just so that they get the daylight. Right. Okay. We'll have an opportunity to really get into the nitty gritty. Okay. I'm just. Yeah. That's part of it. Sorry. But you, we, you got yeah. my. You got my card. You, you oh, yeah. can yeah, absolutely yeah. get a hold and of me. We on hope that, that we encourage you, all staff, to to ask questions, make sure they understand what's going on, okay? That in a nutshell, and then the program, that's that's the homework that got me to the plan, and then the discussions in this observation. We get to the end, I will tell you that I've, I've included a, and I titled it Edgar County Staffing Chart. What that is, is I work with Rod Bottoms from the National Institute of Corrections um, on a project in Pottawatomie, Oklahoma, Shawnee, Oklahoma. And if, have you guys been to Pony? Have any of you guys been to Pony? Yeah. Planning of new institutions. So it's a, it's a class for sheriffs. Yeah. 
So one of the things that they really push is direct supervision, which means that there's a officer in every day room with the inmates, and that supposedly allows that person to get an idea or a feel for what those inmates are doing, how they're responding to each other, what the temperature of that day room is. Well, that's great, and I can do that in places like um, Kansas City or uh, Des Moines or some of the bigger cities that has the access to the larger staff and bigger budgets. When I'm working in places like Brooks County, Kansas, or uh, Pottawatomie, Oklahoma, or Paris, Illinois, or Edgar County, Illinois, I don't necessarily have this kind of staff. So what Rod did, he actually recognized that. He built his own staffing chart. So this is basically a template from what Rod had given to us. I'm not saying that it has to be, you know, you don't, I'm not holding his feet to the fire on this. I don't know if relief factors of two and three make sense for all that. I don't know if you guys even do three shifts for your jail. It's just one of those things that gives you an idea of what somebody from the National Institute of Corrections thinks a staffing plan looks like. And it's yeah, something that's... It's, there's no way to maintain that in the Sure. Jail. Well, and that, you know, we've got <coughs> things in here that we don't even talk about, medical nurse, uh, cook, maintenance, and all that. They might not even be on that. So um, yeah. that's kind of how... That was what that was the red flag for me on this whole report. Yeah. Like, well, the 30, yeah. 30 employees, so <coughs> that cost, that's like one and a half million dollars. Way more and than the cost of brick and mortar and our in the long run. current budget is 1.6, so that's but, a non -starter. But for me... But for me to draw you a plan right. and say we're going to increase this many beds and say that you're not going to have some increase in staffing is maybe not um, prudent on my part either. So right. I want I wanted you at least I, right. everyone to see that this is this is how people like National Institute of Corrections looks mm -hmm. at these things. Right. Uh, but, my goal is to take what you've got and make it work for what what you we build. Right. So. But, you know, I, in the near future, we're going to have to seriously look at what, you know, for these this proposal, what is the actual staffing going to be? And because, I think that's, I mean, and that'll dictate how, how many spends we have. Right. Because or whether we, we can even do it. Point, yeah. You know, I mean, we might sure. not even be able to, you know, well, I told it's you. nice to build a new jail, but we you can't afford to run it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a major concern. We're looking at two per shift. Currently. Okay. Plus, plus our jail administrator. Right. That's well, I would tell you that. And that's if what I, the state does. Okay, that's what I was going to say. If I go through and look at the flags from the state, and I've flagged all of them in their reports, it just gets down to them asking about staffing. Right. And Have you got the most current one? Um, March 27th of 19 and May. 21st of 19 are the two reports I've got. Well, we've got one. Can you get one? Those probably are bad reports. There's right. no doubt about that. Yeah, but, so but, we've had it since. I don't know why. Yeah. And we need to get that to you because back then we only had one person per yeah, shift. Yeah, no, they've added some people. And that's what currently we've you. got eight. You know, that there is, my understanding, every shift you've got two people. Yeah. So, you know, that's a major change, you know, <coughs> you know, you need to get that a copy yeah. of that report. And with this one there's you know, the others multiple violations, a lot of administrators. That's why we're closed down. Yeah. Right. But you know, with the new jail administrator coming in and straightening mm -hmm. things out and hiring the additional people, we were able to get the jail back open and the state has come in, since then has come in and done a report and I think there was only one violation. And uh, that was with uh, making this 30 minute cell checks. And yeah. I think they've addressed that and we're good to go now. And yeah. that's, that's hopefully what I'm doing is just giving you guys some right. ammunition for beating those tabs. Right. And we also realize that potentially that this project can grow to the next level when you're working with Coles County directly. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to say we've asked those questions and provided answers right. because then the person who does that next study probably have some of this information and so then they're not going back and recreating the wheel or changing the wheel per se. Mm -hmm. We can say we've answered, you know, cook's not necessary, you know, they want two per shift. So mm -hmm. we can start to provide some of that information about 
hold on with the next step. Right. I don't know where it is, Sheriff. You may know, but there's also a trigger to staffing at a certain point or a certain self. In other words, if you've got 50, then you jump up for more requirements, I think. I don't know where that is. It could be 60, but if you have more, the more you have, the more staff you need to have, obviously. Do you remember something on that order, Carl, or am I dreaming that? Where if we were at 40, our staffing needs would be... More than layout. Well, well, it's layout, but it also gets to the point where... I don't, I don't think we're close to where that... No. Even at 50 or 60? I don't think so. I don't I don't that. Well, I'd that's have fine. To look at that again, I mean, we need to be... The point right. is we need to be cognizant <coughs> of that. Because putting eight more people on to cover shifts would be devastating. Right. I've got, I've got the Illinois statutes. The most that I think is 60 people you'd have to have is three per shift. See, that's that's what I'm getting. That's, and this that's, is 60, I think. Yeah, it's 50 actually in the housing, and then we make up some of that in that holding area. Okay. And I usually put a skylight in holding, right. so if you've got somebody that just will not work in a housing area, you've got a spot right. that you can put them back in. They're not going to work in a housing area, they're not going to work in the so, Well, at any rate, I'm just yeah. saying we've got to be cognizant of that. Is that, you yeah. know, so we beat that. <laughs> but I have cold. Michael on that, what was that, Friday night? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I read this thing about five times, so. So, anyway, so maybe one thing we should cover over quick is section two, which was the, I'll call it the nerdy math of the jail population study. Michael, does anybody, do we need to take a five minute break? Does somebody need to go to the, the, the little boy's room or anything? What a, well, let's just take a quick break, stretch your feet, uh, go to the gentleman if you have to. Don't smoke them if you got them. That's not part of work. struck off and yeah. I mean again I didn't know you know no, no, I understand but and I was just she had the most recent I like how Bill yeah, even started looking at it identifying the era that we can change the numbers which is kind of interesting here we go here we go I am now okay Sheriff we're gonna get back started again So on the population study, if, if you really like math, this is the, this is the section here for you. And uh, so pretty much our uh, third partner, Bill Garnels, who does this for pretty much a living, took a look at your historical data to chart for you how many inmates you've had. You look at both males and females, you'll see these different charts. And what he's trying to do is to be able to give you a really good feel about which a population has been and what he thinks the population is going to be. Because ultimately, as a county board, you're going to be making that decision based upon information, an informed decision, what's the right size jail. And so we're trying to give enough information to you so you can feel that that's a good decision that's being made. And you'll see on uh, some of these charts here, he's charting you, average uh, population tends to be running about 30, am I? Right on that, yeah. About 30 total, and you're going to have peaks. They're going to have times where you can be up to 40 or 48. And uh, right now, your jail doesn't have much for the sheriff and the jail administrator talked about is being able to have the ability to isolate or to classify and to separate. And so, when we came up with the number that we did for a 60 bed jail, that gives you in the dorm area a total of. Cell area, we've got 60 laid out there. Then there's also the, the holding cells that could also be used as separate isolation cells. We're trying to give you the flexibility because, trying to make kind of a, a chuckle about it, right now there's males and females. We know that's changing. 
and how could that change the jail here in the future? So being able to isolate and be able to move and classify differently, why build a jail now that might not serve those needs? We're trying to give you flexibility without overbuilding. So obviously we don't want overbuild. There's only so much you can afford to do. So we're trying to make sure we get enough in that five pound bag that gets you a good jail that's gonna last you for many years to come. So the, the highlight is I think on the very last page of that jail inmate study, just to get to the that section two, he talks about your average daily count for the past seven and a half years You've been averaging 30 inmates, and you know what's that? The highest numbers of those been, you know, 35, 34. You know, and that's on the annual, and then what it was like on a monthly basis. So when you look at a monthly basis, that's when you start to get in the 40s, even the high 40s. <coughs> now the daily population, because you know you've got people coming in and out on a regular basis too. That's when you're starting to get into the 50s, <coughs> and though that was the peak time in 2016. But when you look at one of his charts, 2016 was a peak and it's gone down, and now we're peaking back up again. So we want to make sure we're providing some of that flexibility. That first chart that I talked about, that peak trend, that was the third page, where you can see we're charting it in about 2016. That's where you're at in the peak. Pandemics definitely changed the way things have been tracked. Um, I like for some respects, it didn't really deter crime, um, unfortunately. Um, so it has, uh, hopefully this gives you a good idea that when we're designing out the size of jail that we did, there was actually some science involved. that wasn't just some guys in the room saying, oh, I'll just do 16 calls a year. There's some thought that went into that. Any questions at all? You talked about the new state law. <coughs> They'll have to bond out. They will not actually... Uh, Number of or the capacity of a new jail, and so it's probably going to change how many people stay in. It absolutely could. We don't know yet. I, I was just talking to Jay about <coughs> Arkansas had a law passed uh, probably 2014 that they were going to start moving more state inmates back to county jails, and they call it the 309 program. So we refer to all those people as 309s, which is kind of silly, but every jail that I've done down in Arkansas had to design space in for 309s, and they really thought that that was going to move larger numbers of people from the prison system into the county jails. And it, at first, there was an influx, but it's, it's all tapered back off. So their thoughts were, I had a, a gentleman, we built a 416-bed addition to an 84 bed jail and gave him 500 beds. He's now housing feds and ice and stuff like that in there to make up all the beds that he wasn't filling with 309s. Um, well, and that, that, that particular sheriff has done really well for his county for that reason, but um, I'm not pretty, I'm, I will tell you, I'm not a jail for profit guy. I think you don't know revenue streams or you can't guarantee revenue streams, so I like to build to population studies. The other thing is, if we're seeing 40, 48, and we're sh telling you that we've got 50 beds in housing and then some additional space in, in booking, you guys have what we call them weekenders. We, there's a lot of different names for the guys that just get picked up and they're there for a weekend and then they're gone. Oh, frequent yeah. flyers. Yeah, okay. I used that earlier. I didn't think about it in this, in this situation. But the Otis's of the world, there's, there's always a need for a little extra space in those facilities for that. So what, what's the rule of thumb, law enforcement guys, is it 80, 85% capacity and then you leave 15 for overage? is what kind of the rule of thumb is for holding uh, in, inmates in a facility is you need that extra room for situations. Um, so you'll see that when I, the past when I've worked with uh, Mr. Garnos, uh, we've always kind of, if it was a 48, we've looked at that 50 and 60 mark as the total beds that you're going to need. You might, the, the other thing I'll tell you, one of the things that I learned like I said, I started doing this pre-adjudicated stuff, and, and I did prison stuff before that, but I pre-adjudicated, I started doing it in 95, and one of the things I figured out really quick that the most flexible thing I can give a sheriff is a, a two-bunk cell. 
because he doesn't have to put two people in that cell. He can treat it like a seg cell and put one in. Um, I also learned real early in, in my career that uh, I can put bean holes on certain cells in every day room and let him be able to segregate people within a day room. Uh, they don't always have good days. They might get a, a, a visit from a spouse or whatever that says, hey, guess what? Here are some divorce papers you need to sign or you know, something along those lines. And so those guys may not play well for a week or two. So you move them into another location or you find a way to get them in a uh, more, feed them in their cell, medicate them in their cell, all that kind of stuff. So what I've, I've learned over the years is I try to minimize inmate movement and maximize views into those areas so that we don't have mishaps and self-harm uh, situations. Uh, we watch tour all of our facilities, which is a, a point A to point B check. You go and check every person in their cell, and you start with a, a touch of a button or a touch of, we call it the pipe, and then you go to the other end. After you've checked everybody, you touch the other end, and it documents. I had a staff member that walked that area and looked in those cells every so many minutes, however you guys want to do that. So. Um, that's just a thing to help you guys from a liability standpoint for the most part. And with the no bond thing, I mean, that's going to be letting out more of the minor offenses. But the ones with the more major offenses, they're still going to be in. Uh, yeah, they're not going to be, you're not, there's not going to be no bail for murders. And, right. So it's, and those are the ones that tend to be in there for long periods of time anyway. So Kirk, you had I guess question. with the money and the, and the right lawyer. Yeah. Yes, in, in regards to the the inmate average numbers you're looking at, was there any correlation or did you guys look at how that related to how many deputies are on duty and what impact if we had more deputies on duty, what, how it would affect those potential numbers? That even gets down to your judges, to be honest. Or, and, and that's kind of where I was yeah. going because hey, we, we did, and I don't know how you guys are moving towards the 1% safety tax, but there's been talk that we're going to put more deputies up, possibly more deputies on the street. If we put more deputies on the street, what can we anticipate with those numbers increasing? Well, you, and you guys probably, I mean, they can probably tell you right now how many warrants are out. I mean, if truth be told, you'd probably fill a much bigger facility if you wanted to go do it, do it that way. That's why am I asking? A lot, a lot of, um, there's always a kind of an interest, interesting correlation between, you know, your judges, your number of guys that are patrolling in, in, in the jail itself. A lot of times people will say we don't have the capacity and, and there are other <coughs> avenues to control or watch the person that may have, whatever that offense is, they can put a, a, an ankle bracelet on them or whatever and, and you know handle things a little bit differently than using a jail cell. You know, we have a lot of guys that say I want a work release program Work release programs are great if the judges like it and the sheriff likes it and the community likes it. So did these it always work that way? Did these numbers take any consideration as to what we currently have on the street for deputies? It gets down to um, bookings, um, and then it does get down to um, he takes the information about court, uh, how many trials are held or how many hearings are held, I believe. Um, I don't do Bill's job, so I can't maybe answer for Bill Garnos on this, but he does look at numbers of arrests, numbers of um, uh, court cases, and numbers of uh, convictions. So there is a, a little bit of that, but I don't think he ties it down to a direct number of deputies on the street. Thank you. One of the other things he factors in is also the population of the county, because we know as, I mean, as the population of the people changes, so this crime as well, so he's trying to factor that information in. So we're trying to make an accurate representation. He talks about that on page B. That stuff. So now that we've talked through some of the major sections here, um, any other questions from people? I know one thing, Vital County, which is over at Terre Haute, just across the state line, <coughs> they're in the process of building a new jail now. But in reading the paper, they had a lot of they had several community meetings to have the public come in to see what their thoughts were, and a lot of those people wanted to see programs instituted and services to keep them out of the jail. Yeah. 
and that's something that we talked about some time ago, a few months ago, about having more substance abuse counselors, people to deal with mental health. You know, the sheriff constantly is talking about people that he's got in jail that have no business being there. You know, mental health issues, you know, if we can provide counseling to get some of those people and keep them out of the jail. And, you know, we had a tour of the human resource facility a couple weeks ago, and they talked about some of their programs and everything, and I asked him what the number one issue in Edgar County is, and he says substance abuse. And somehow we would like to help them to get more counselors to keep them out of the jail. You know, we have, I know Jay has talked about it, and the sheriff's talked about it, you know, all the different people. By far, the majority of the people in there are drug related. You know, they also, you know, it's about the safety of the public, you know, with all this substance abuse, you know. Obviously, a lot of this thefts and everything, you know, people are stealing it to get money to buy drugs. You know, it, it also goes back to, you know, we talked about this task force with the city. You know, quite honestly, there's not much being done towards drugs, drugs right now. And, you know, it's just a lot of things that we can do to make the community better and to maybe help keep the jail population down. And, so, you know, we talked about with the... Um, the guy from Human Resource, they don't come into the jail now because there's no place in the current jail, no place to meet with the people and everything. You know, that that's one thing I want to make sure that we have, you know, if we end up building a new jail, a place where they can come in and do counseling sessions and stuff. And, and right now I'll tell you that I don't have a lot of space in there. I've got a lot of multiple purpose spaces right. in there, but nothing that's really designated as programming. Yeah. Which Programming is simply like GED, Alcoholics Anonymous, right. Narcotics Anonymous, all that stuff. Recidivism is a, a, a huge talking point right mm -hmm. now. You've done, you, what, what, what's your, what have you done in the past? Though? Well, my dad was sheriff back in the 70s, okay. and I worked at the jail for I 28 years. I can talk with you then, too. 28 years. Um, I was sheriff for 12 years. Okay. I've been on the county board almost 12 years. So okay. I know what's... I gotcha. Under, gotcha. So... I understand. You, you understand the recidivism has been right. something that's been talked about for a long, long time. Right. And there are programs that actually do work. Mm -hmm. um, what I found is kind of the problem with a lot of communities is it's hard to keep school districts to... To maintain funding for GED, it's mm -hmm. it's hard to keep volunteers coming in. I mean, pastors will come in, or priests and pastors will mm -hmm. come in. That's not as big a problem as trying to get a school district to maintain a budget for kind of when things get tough for GED or um, finding the volunteers that can come in and do the Alcoholics Anonymous and stuff like that. But that they. The twelve-step programs do seem to work. They can help those people. GED obviously is important because we want to get somebody the opportunity to at least find work when they get out. Um, I, I'm working with Stone County, Arkansas right now, and, and we're actually trying to turn a portion of their existing jail, which is going to be maintained as a admin building. We're turning one of the pods into an evidence storage and processing and one of them into a uh, programming area. So we'll have two classrooms in that that they can bring people in and they can walk people in a secure corridor to that space and then they can, you know, work on everything from church services to GEDs and, and some of the other aspects of that. Now we don't have, it's, it's a jail, it's not a prison, so trades don't get taught. That's a little bit different. And, a lot of people struggle with the whole difference between a, a jail and a prison. These guys are awaiting uh, adjudication to find out what they're going to do or where they're going to go. Um, and a lot of prisons do have programs where they can, you know, be taught some trades. Um, we're kind of a holding point for that. So for us, if we can get them, you know, a GED taken care of or help them at least on a path of sobriety of some kind, it's that's kind of the important thing. We're going to be moving into the next phase. It kind of kicks off with with the 21st and the what Carl and we're all talking about and looking forward to 
that's what they're going to look at. The grant was written on just not building jail cells. The grant was looking at how it could relate to the to the justice in this county and rehabilitation of different people with different problems. And that's what they're going to be looking at. And this facility may grow. Maybe it gets another floor. I don't know how many floors is it right now. It's just a single floor with a mezzanine on the housing. Okay, alone. so it, it can go up, it can go out, it can go <coughs> a number of different ways. And that's where we need to involve the, the community. And also we have received uh, rescue money from the vets that can be used for some of these programs starting to call it an investment in the future. If we're, we can go to several different pronged approach, increasing counseling, increasing facilities. For example, they're going to lose a facility if they don't change it out there at HRC. So, I mean, there's there are, we have flexibility. Does your county have a 708 board? Yes, absolutely. And uh, so they've been involved. Yeah, and they are involved. It definitely helps take some weight off of the jail too because a lot of times these people with those disabilities they end up in the jail because they got off of medication and you know landed there and get them back on their medication get them out of the jail hand because the jail's not designed to deal with that and the correction staff don't need to be dealing with that they need to get special people so that's really giving hrc just you know two staff members and then it shuts off in a couple of years We'll scrap them. I mean, we want to contribute where it can materially relieve some of their money obligations, and they can go forward with uh, with full time or part time for the future staff. So, at any rate, that's that's our intent. We got to decide whether what we're going to do here with the jail, and then move forward. And we're going to get all kinds of committees. We're going to all meet on the 21st and we'll get some input. But we're definitely gonna move into a more exciting phase, I think, where we can actually define this stuff. But it, uh, you folks at Coles County wanted to see what this looks like, and we all agree that we've gotta make some decisions soon about certain things, and you'll let us know, I assume. Yeah. And please, yeah. hop in here. Oh, I'm, I'm tired of doing that. I'm tired of doing that. I'm very still. People with responsibilities in the county in different areas. And there's been a lot of talk of, of substance abuse and how that can be addressed, if that should be part of the new facility, or at least some access is part of that, and also some aspects about the courts right. and so forth. And of course, a lot of that's also going to be, I mean, there's desires and willingness, but the money. So when we have the RFQ, I'm, I'm guessing that we'll have <coughs> alternatives. Right. One will be basically what we're talking about here, probably assuming that you're going to move forward. Uh, and then there'll be more expensive alternatives that would incorporate more things that we'll be discussing. So. More of a multi-agency approach to them, yeah. for this to grow from the just a county jail to partnership with your other different organizations. Is your rehab facility in Charleston still operating? That car, our house? I saw yes. there one time. That's one. It is, yes. Okay. Are they full? Are they take more people? I think they're full all the That's time, from what I understand. So, well, if we're going to really do something that's important in long term, we need to plan this right. Not just for the next few years, but we need to have something that makes sense for the next 25 years and beyond. If we can, at least give us some flexibility to build up. You and I'll be gone, Phil. I'll be gone a long time for you. You and I'll be gone. Two, yeah. <laughs> well, I think anything that we talk about within the facility that we've got here, I mean, if it's an additional space, I think it, it's a positive for the county to have that kind of space, but I think you've got to also look at it as what other things can occur in that space to make that square footage valuable to the county. Um, I, you know, I might have an interview room that also might become my first appearance video so that I can talk to the judge. I mean, if it's just a matter of putting up uh, a security plate in with some different outlets and stuff on the backside that we can access, these these facilities cost 
more than my hospital facilities do. I mean, surgery suites are kind of set aside. Quite honestly, kitchens can also go in that same category, believe it or not. Stainless steel and kitchens cost a lot of money, but you know, we're, and I, I don't know if I can say it right now, but we're looking at 420, 425 a square foot on a lot of this stuff right now. Um, that's not counting, not counting this recent influx of gigantic distribution warehouses and stuff. So, but the, you know, that's a fairly good number for the last six that I've done. It works right into that from 408 to 427, somewhere like that. So, um, I don't take, uh, I grew up in a household where my dad didn't even want to have things added to the school that would have benefited his kids. So, uh, I, I look at everything in terms of <coughs> how does that dollar affect that taxpayer that's going to be paying for this thing. So, that's one of the things that it's really nice and it's really easy to say, let's add this, this, and this, the wish list that I talked about earlier, but there's got to be a value to the community when you do that. There's got to be a reason behind each one of those spaces. So, and on your square foot costs, does that include the site costs? No, that's, that's the construction of the building that doesn't okay. include the site costs. I want to always make sure people explain that that's the yeah. building cost. The site itself has its own cost to it. We can't <coughs> speak to that right now because we don't have a, we don't have a so site site site. Site. So when you're thinking your budget number and you're writing down 420, that doesn't include the site cost as well. There's mm -hmm. soft costs. There's a lot of things that go into project costs versus construction costs and stuff like that. But we can, we, as we drill down on this thing, that stuff becomes a lot more apparent as you start working through it. I just think everyone should understand that these are important buildings to the community, whether some folks think they are or not, they are. Um, you got people that work in those facilities that deserve to go to work at a place that's safe, secure, and, and a reasonable place for them to work in. But all those spaces have to have reasons. You can't just have stuff sat in there. I walked into a facility in Salina, Kansas. Uh, they're, they're doing a new facility. I asked them, they were talking a lot about recidivism. I asked them, what's that space over there? There were school desks in it, and they were piled up real high, and a whole bunch of other stuff in it. So that that was our program. You know? and so you're asking me about recidivism, and your your room's piled up with junk right now. I said, what's going on? The school pulled out, didn't have money, so they pulled out. So kind of an interesting dichotomy on some of that stuff. That we'd like to see that number. We'd like to reduce the number of beds, but we're not willing to put the effort into helping that. The pie is only so big, and you want to make sure that we spend it on the right things. Yeah, I might have missed it, but we're talking about a particular site for the jail. Yeah. Or well, they have one that, that for example, yeah. work across the street, but they they don't have they want to put as well. Yeah, <coughs> I don't have a lot of room for additional parking, and where I think they said they could turn part of that area where the yeah, old side. jail is or the existing right. jail is into parking. Okay. I just wanted. I thought we talked about that before. So sure. On the fit the cost figure you said four, four and a quarter, is that based on an Illinois prevailing wage or where no, that comes Missouri from? Missouri prevailing wage. Okay. I that's did. gonna be a lot higher here. Yeah. And that's and I think um, that was part of the discussion that we had, I think, when I was sitting over the jail that, that was that was based on six jails I've done in Missouri. Okay. And they prevailing wage, it's a lot different than Kansas or Arkansas. Place in South Dakota, you know, I'm doing work in South Dakota, and you now the numbers aren't nearly the same. Right. And yeah, we're terrible on prevailing yeah, I've got, wage. I've got all sorts of books up on my shelf from the different states I'm working in, and there, and they do range quite, quite a bit from yeah. Arkansas to Illinois, kind of as that hierarchy goes. Have you heard, have you had any connection with the 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 90 percent law that's currently in place in Illinois? We yeah, we started looking at that on Warren okay. County. Because there has been some problems, and that could, you know, especially, I assume these are, I mean, your, all your contractors are going to be somewhat specialized, and your out-of-state contractors is going to cost more. Yes. Well, can you explain what you mean there? Uh, currently, our, your unemployment rate triggered a law that requires public <laughs> projects to use 90% of Illinois residents. So, that's on specialized things like this, like, for instance, you know, we recently were looking at the water tower, but that's very specialized. So, some of your contractors are out-of-state, and they have to hire Illinois people, pretty much in addition to their own employees already have, so increase your cost. But that's yeah. state funds though, right? 
Well, that's the federal the state for statute. For statute. Yeah, state statute. So yeah, we'll have to look, have to look into that. You know, I don't think it's, that's going to apply to this or not. So the way that statute's written, it's based upon the local unemployment level. Actually, I think it's the statewide unemployment statewide, level. Yeah, Once it gets peaked up above a certain point, that triggers in because the idea is that then you're <clears throat> immediately putting more LMI people to work. But that doesn't necessarily work in construction because you just can't take some guy off the street give them a hammer yeah. and have them be able to do something competently yeah. in some of uh, the construction trades, especially when you get into some of these specialties things. So I, I don't know as far as, you know, depend, if any, any Illinois money touches this project. Well, so compound that with USDA, if it, if yeah. it happened to be USDA, there's US only few places in, in the <coughs> requirement as well. And, you know, a lot of the electronics, they, they pulled that out because we just don't have a lot of, yeah. you know, U.S. electronics. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I Sometimes if, when I'm working on these, I, I feel like I'm like a uh, silly putty. I'm getting pulled a lot of different directions, trying to keep up with a lot of different different things from state statutes to the federal USDA stuff. But we do a lot of, even in our healthcare side, we do a lot of USDA stuff, so we've got that pretty well figured out. And they all, yeah, and all those things do kind of affect, yeah, it can affect the cost. And if everything went right, and we decided to build a jail or whatever, we wouldn't be moving any dirt for about two years. Who knows what it's going to be like in two years? Typically for, yeah, or three years. If, you, if, you, if you're going to have to, if you're going to get a loan, that's one thing that if you go through a referendum process, you know. We've already done. All right, so. You know, it, it takes me, you know, by the time I get through schematic design development and then six months of construction documents to get the drawings where somebody can actually build from them. Well, I'm just saying, even if everything went right, we don't know what's understood going to be. You're right, everything like. They get the same question over and over again. And we pass the safety tax, when are we going to get a new jail? So what would be my answer? Never. No. No. Oh, why no, you say that? I never tried this to I said, really, I said, I mean, we're I'll start, out. we'll start digging a hole as soon as you want, yeah. sir. <laughs> I, said, I said, now we have, part, we have our architect, which is good. That's well, a starting point. And we they're tell. only, they're not in it it's on the long haul yet. I know. Coles County still has to, what do they call that, a R RFQ. RFQ, to actually select an architect. They're on board to do the preliminary work. And it's hard to convince them that we actually are doing something on the new jail. They want to know where we're spending money after we pass the safety measure. So really you're at step one of a three-step process mm -hmm. right now. We've completed your jail study for Buck County. Uh, Coles County is looking to issue an RFQ for a study of the, what could be the county jail growing with these other agencies to become that bigger facility. And there's a timeline that goes to that. And then once that's done, then there'll be a final RFQ to go hire an architect to actually do construction drawings. And then four step would be to go build. Mm -hmm. So there's, if you want to think about where you're at in the process, step one, step one. We're, we're at the beginning, or the end of the beginning, we're at the end of the first phase, well, if you want to call it. At this point, I mean, basically, the old jail well, can't be used, according to your yep. And you got to give it just an estimate of what the size of a new one needs to be. Mm -hmm. And we kind of need that information before we can move forward with exactly. Well, at least we're doing something that, that's something mm -hmm. they want to know. What are we doing? Yeah. yeah. What does this board need to do? What they did. So mm -hmm. I think uh, we'll talk about some talking points and some takeaways. So what this did is going to help them get teed up to put out their RFQ. Because now they can say, well, as you probably most likely reference our documents, in their RFQ to say when people are proposing on doing this larger study, we're not asking you to go reinvent the jail wheel portion of it because this part has already been done and already probably somewhat decided by Edgar County in terms of new jail, potentially the jail beds. So we're going to have some follow-up conversations with the sheriff and the staff to make sure if we need to make some tweaks to some things in our documents, we can do that and any input coming from the board itself. And we're going to be doing final draft of this that's going to be created and sent out before your upcoming June 21st meeting. Because the June 21st meeting is really when 
the Coles County initiative starts to bring a lot of those, and if I'm talking out of turn on that, let me know. That's when a lot of those players, of those potential agencies that would partner on this larger effort, come to the table for the first time. And it'll be nice because then they can hear, because the catalyst of this whole thing is the county jail. And so we'll be making a similar presentation, maybe a little bit shorter, but talking about here's the jail portion of it. So that way all of those partners that are going to be invited to that understand that this project now grows from becoming a county jail plus these other things. And do they want their agency <coughs> or their organization joining into that effort? And uh, so we're very close to wrapping up our project here for you on this. And uh, we'd like to be part of the next study as well and do the drawings for you. So our commitment, uh, as far as Clinger and HMN, we like to start projects and end projects. And we're not afraid to compete either because we know qualifications you got to compete. That doesn't scare either one of us. It's pretty good at what we do, we think. So uh, we're quite happy to continue to compete to uh, hopefully continue working with you find folks. I know I just did some quick math based on the, I think you said your floor plan is 28,000 square feet. And with the, the cost that you gave us, you're looking at a $12 million project. Probably a little closer than that. Yeah. That's just for the jail. You know, obviously, we got site. And so, you know, I think you're ahead $12 million. When we actually start planning a budget number, we're also going to talk about contingency. Right. Because the contingency is going to be important nowadays because we don't know what the prices are going to be. Right. Uh, we're both working on projects right now, and contractors, they can't. Normally, you could say, can you hold your price for 45 days? No, no, no. Uh, one contractor is telling me he can't get his subs to hold the price for more than five days just because things are, for a variety of different reasons, are just crazy. Twice as much. But in a year and a half, for me, not maybe it'll be yeah. the, the pandemic bump will be. Well, maybe it'll be tough. It could be worse. Yeah. Get a couple big hurricanes in there. going to release another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, any other final questions at all? Well, yeah. You're yeah. going to get to know you people. I know you've, you've seen us in emails and so forth, so it's, I always like to be able to come in uh, with people in person. Uh, Sean does as well. Hmm. But you're real proud, Rick does so. Yeah, real, 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 real proud. <laughs> Kelly, well, did you honestly? Know, we all I know is you're a taskmaster yeah. that makes yeah. guys yeah. run a lot. It's yeah. what I've got from He this. got everything he deserved, and so did every other guy that's <laughs> really around there. I'm a part of the future, so I had him in class, I had him in class. Yeah. Yeah. I think Kelly, Kelly has something he wanted to say. I was just going to mention, and Kevin, go ahead and jump in. Kevin's done most of the work on this. Beth me um, also, but this grant is a two-year grant. The grant pays for a staff member to work 75% of their time on this grant. Right now they've been full-time, so you know we're six months or five months into it, so we're looking at another you know, year and a half before we have anything done. The grant also not only covers you know, the facilities for the jail and the things we can put in the jail, but we're also looking at community facilities in other communities in Edgar County. So if there's a village hall or city hall that needs replaced, you know, we also look at those and include them in the plan. And the goal of the plan is to have this project, what, whatever the project might be, whether it's a jail or a community center somewhere, uh, ready for funding. So, and that's why the USDA has this grant basically to have a community shovel ready um, and get funding at the end of the 24 months. So our plan will most likely you'll be promoting the jail as the primary, but it would be, as he said, it'll be identifying other facilities that maybe can't be incorporated into that, but are, there's a needs base, so that'll be mapped out for those communities to have that in a formally adopted plan. And as far as like the expense, um, we put out that amortization schedule you know, if you're financing ten million dollars on current USDA rates at twenty years, it's six hundred sixty thousand dollars a year, approximately. So, um, six hundred sixty thousand dollars for twenty years at current rates for financing ten million. 
they do allow to go out longer. However, yeah. you know, you're getting to the point where the building is going to need work. And at 40 years, it was 381. somewhere in between. Yeah. And the, there's other stakeholders that are, have expressed interest or at least interested in spending or helping us financially with it. Okay? Without getting into committing anybody. There are other agencies that are willing to spend money because they're going to have to eventually spend money themselves right. and if this right. can all if you can combine budgets that's more economical okay. under one roof versus right every single room. And you know right now it's twenty eight thousand it might wind up being whatever the jail portion may become less than that. And if you look at my program it's like thirty three thousand we did it in twenty eight. So I saw that yeah. Any other final questions for us? So you're saying a year and a half, well, you can't wait till a year and a half now, but we have an, up until a year and a half to make a final decision on what is going to be our project. Well, a year and a half from now, the, what the grant is really designed to do is to, if you have a project identified, is to be presentable to, within a year and a half, presentable have to the USDA. Completed and ready to for the USDA say yes, we will finance okay. this or no, we won't. Obviously so we you're going to ask us at certain points for decisions? <laughs> yeah. Okay? In other words, some of the tough ones may be earlier than we want them or later. You know, you do, we yeah. just... Well, the RFQ we'll be doing, you know, you'll get prices. So, well, here's the jail with additional mental health facilities. I don't know, here's a jail with a court full full-size courtroom for juries and so forth, and here's just basically a jail, whatever your options are, and it's going to cost, estimate this, and at that point you'll need to go to the USDA, you're going to say, you know, this is $15 million or whatever, or whatever the price is, and, and uh, you know, that's what you want to finance or whatever. Am I also correct, I would leave the right impression, that the more we have that would say helped mitigate some of the issues like mental health, drug abuse, and so forth, would increase our, uh, uh, our probably chances of getting funding? I don't know if I can say that for sure. Well, I mean, I know the application probably wouldn't have succeeded if we yeah. hadn't yeah. have included some of the stuff in there. Yeah. Having the study in place definitely would be a positive when you're applying for additional funds. Okay. And that's why we're counting on you to put us in a condition where we have that flexibility. Right. Without you, we probably couldn't. And that's why, you know, if you need a fire station somewhere, it needs to be included in this plan. That's in Kansas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, things like a fire station in Kansas, if we include it in this plan and they want to go out for funding later, I mean, it it does help. So it won't it's be part of the jail, but it could be added to it, building. Really? Yeah, we got my that. green light on that one. <laughs> well, it's kind of like the emergency plan that we're doing through ESDA. Mm -hmm. If we don't do it, we can't get funding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it identifies all the issues that we have out there so that we're organized. And that's basically what you're going to do for the county is organize us, organize it, maybe not prioritize it, but organize us in the projects that we have identified ourselves with you Correct. that we need. Yeah, and the county board will prioritize in conjunction possibly with some of these other stakeholders, the city. Or, you know, well, we've got stakeholders from about every yeah. other. So. You know, once, you know, if the city of Paris wants to participate or right. something, police or whatever, then determine what your budget is and make your decision. And a lot of those things will come up in public meetings and other meetings that we have in the future. So right. I imagine we'll have a series of meetings, at least five, I would think. Okay. I mean, Jeff, you mentioned ESDA. Has there been any talk on potential replacement or whatever tornado yeah. sirens? I don't know whether that specifically been done, but we've talked about the needs for ESDA, yes. Yeah. 
we're looking at that currently. Okay. Now, I, whether that culminates in sirens, I can't tell you. But yes, as does needs are being taken into consideration interactively. So. My understanding is currently, and for the past few years, USD has had quite a bit of money available for these loans. So I could, can't say for sure two years from now they will have. Yeah. Well, and grants for tornado sirens. So. Yes. We definitely need that. Yeah, we don't have any. Yeah, I mean, they, I think they issued twenty-five thousand dollars worth of grants um, to communities and counties for things like police cars, radios, or tornado, uh, we've got or that tornado, tornado sirens, we've things got like that. that. Yeah, and the village can you know, apply for the fire department can apply for the for that grant, but it's usually it's a the grant that grant itself maxes at twenty-five, and it's usually year for saying so it's like a fifty thousand dollar project they'll pay twenty-five. It depends upon the community and what the local well, well, moderate income is in the community, what percentage they pay. Like on the police cars, Carl, we, we yeah. had to right. plug down some money in there for the sheriff. I think they'll pay up to 90% on those. I don't think they'll go. Well, that, that depends on how the community. I'm a very community here. But yeah. So they have, have a very low Yeah, and they have a very low income to get that percentage. <clears throat> Anybody? Additional questions? I got it. Yes. On this floor plan for the jail, I assume you got a small, and I remember you making a comment, a small courtroom. Yes, it's in the center of the space. So when you uh, kind of come through the front okay. door. Yeah, DOC training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's one of those like all multi-purpose rooms. Yeah. It can be used as, it's, it's going to be only for a first appearance. It's not for a trial court. Right. So right. it'll be used couple hours a week for a report setting and then it can be utilized as multi-purpose space for a training facility for the sheriff's staff or other and then I don't know if it's going to be quite large enough for an EOC type but at least we're trying to show that we're looking multi-purpose spaces rather than separate. Well I know here a couple of weeks ago when they were taking the prisoners to court they were leaving seven or eight prisoners up there there was two deputies with them and a little bit later, about a half block later, I saw the jail administrator coming up there. There was three court security guys down there in the basement at the metal detector. There was one deputy up in the courtroom. So that's seven people taking some prison, you know, dealing with that for an hour or two hours. Where if we could do it all at the jail, mm -hmm. yeah. look at call the manpower that's wasted just right. shuttling people back up there. But we also and we've had this problem for years. When I was there 20 years ago, I, we had the fiber optic to have a video conference. The judge would not go along with us. I want him in front of me. Yeah. And we still, still have that problem. I was going to say, I, that's an issue that we're going to have to deal with. They're going to have to understand that they're going to have to. They're going to have to. It's a coin toss for me a lot of times right. whether they want to do the video visit or not. Right. I'm sorry, not video visit, first appearance video. Yeah, right. um, I've had uh, two judges that uh, when I started the jail project, they said, we're not going to travel out to your facility and use your courtroom. Right. And then as soon as both of those were older judges, as soon as they sat down and the new younger judges came on board, I've not had a problem with them. They right. love going and take care of it. Now I've got two or three now facilities that have a courtroom built into them. Mm -hmm. Not jury court typically, but right. uh, old people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, guys. I'm I'm getting pretty white in the beard too, so uh, anything else, girl? Like I said, I like minimizing inmate movement if I can. Did either of you or any of the four of you have anything wrap up wise that you want to say for this meeting or we can be there? Writers there. We threw some information on ourselves up in the front in case you wonder what the heck were those two jokers that came to talk to us. Has a little information on us and our firms. And you know, you asked about you know, we love working with county boards. Both our firms, we do most of our work in rural counties, very much like Edgar County. So these are the kind of groups I like to work with. You get to those big city areas, it's a whole different kind of people. So this this is kind of most of what our two firms do is working in rural areas. So. I think we're a good fit for you because we understand because we work in these communities all the time. We're pretty rural. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Phil made it. Andy seconds. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. We are adjourned.